Thank you very much. So a couple of uh, co-authors are here in the audience, so Tom and, and Angie. Uh, so I've given the talks or similar talks over the years at this conference, and one of the reasons is to try to recruit young people because um, originally it was a 200-year study. We, we scaled it back a little bit, but we still don't anticipate most of the original people being around in another 135 years. So we need help. So the initial goals of the project, we, want, we established five monitoring plots, um, sites associated with the former Vermont Monitoring Cooperative. And we originally thought we were going to sample at these uh, increasingly lengthy intervals. I'm not sure why. Um, also, we realized that somebody else would probably have to worry about that. And analyze initial samples to determine baseline values and archive for later comparison. And part of the impetus for this came from the acid rain era when people were looking at trying to look at change in soils and there really was no baseline whatsoever, no baseline data on, on these up far soils and the higher elevations. And now with climate change, it's also a good opportunity. So that our fifth is just to protect these for future monitoring. So there's five sites, three in the north and three in the south of Vermont. Um, and three on Mount Mansfield, there's uh, northern hardwood, and then a high elevation spruce fir, um, near 3,400 feet, and then a more transitional forest in Underhill State Park, which also has a soil climate analysis network site. So it has a, a, like a weather monitoring that includes soil moisture and temperature down to a fairly good depth. And then down in the Lybrook Wilderness area, there's one uh, close to the entrance, uh, also with a scan site, and then one a bit further in, in the woods. Which incidentally is a good, if you want to get lost in the mountains in Vermont, Lybrook Wilderness Area is the best place to do it. <laughs> uh, it's nice and flat. Um, so here is just a Google Earth image. And, uh, so the forehead site is very close to the forehead of the, the top of Mount Mansfield. Underhill's all over on the west, and Ranch Brook is Sort of, um, it's on the eastern slopes, a little bit to the south in the Ranch Brook watershed. There's Stowe ski area for those of you. Want some orientation? And then down south uh, near Manchester, Arlington, Vermont, um, so southwestern Vermont, two sites off the Kelly Stand Road um, in Bourne Pond. And again, a ski area over in Stratton. So for the last three sampling times, so the last was the summer before, we um, sampled uh, 10 plots, uh, dug a soil pit, and collected four main samples to archive. But then we also collected samples of, of each soil horizon as we went down. Our first time in 2002, we just collected these samples by horizon, and then we realized that it's going to be hard to compare because there's a lot of different horizon combinations possible among 10 different pits within a small area. So just a picture of a bunch of uh, bags of soil. And here's a picture of the different horizons we'd find in, in a good spodosol pit. This is from uh, the Light Trail over Goldness area. And then over these last four times, we have 1,855 Samples. Uh, they're currently archived in the basement of Jeffords Hall. Um, Emily, who's here in the audience, helped archive the last set. And this is just a plot plan showing the, it says yellow, but more like brown, where um, we've sampled over the last four sampling periods in the whites where we haven't sampled. It's just randomly selecting 10 plots each sampling time. Yeah, it's just a few scenes from the um, last sampling. We had uh, the range through Angie of the Forest Service, a crew from the Vermont Youth Conservation Corps. It turned out that this crew actually um, was a, a number of people couldn't uh, deaf mute, so it presented an interesting challenge for sampling soil pits, but one that we, I think we did well. Um, here's Emily and Scott Bailey of the Forest Service over in New Hampshire sampling on the forehead site. Angie sampling soil in Light Brook with a, I don't know if you noticed that, but she has a knife. Uh, 
another recent grad of UVM sampling for soil mercury. <coughs> Emily Fiche was now a graduate student in the Rubenstein School um, and also very good at sampling soil pits. And just a few looks at the different uh, forests, Ranch Brook back in 2002, Underhill State Park, these are both on Mount Mansfield. Then the forehead site, uh, as you might tell from here, is a little bit the higher elevation and more spruce fir. Um, look at uh, Tom Villers uh, put together these just profile images. So these 25, 50, 75 centimeters of the forehead site, which is our most variable. And actually, if you're into soil taxonomy, there's four different soil orders at, at these sites. And our first publication of, of this whole project is actually about that fact of the being four different soil orders. But you might be able to see the, the challenge of uh, long-term monitoring in these sites when you get this huge variability in, in, in soil profiles. And here's just an example of a, of a soil pit or lack of soil pit in the forehead. The other sites are a little more homogeneous, but still some variability in, uh, in soil depth in horizonation. Um, this is just a, an example. So the different colors are different soil horizons. And a pretty picture of a, a spot of soil from the Lye Trail site. And another one from the Lye Brook Trail site. And then the Ranch Brook also relatively a little more homogeneous and a little more boring soils. The pH there is a little bit higher and they're, they're not spodosols, they're more inceptosols, so this not as evident the, the soil, uh, or at least the soil colors aren't as pretty as the other spots. So, got some data. So, um, this is from the B horizon, so the horizon um, is usually about Oh, 10, 20 centimeters deep in the soil. Uh, so it's a horizon of things that are accumulating that leach down from above. And we're looking at um, exchangeable aluminum over this um, uh, four sampling period. So it's a 15 year period with the first one being year zero. And again, the sampling was a little bit different at year zero. So the, you have to take the first red bars with a grain of salt. But one thing you can see here is um, I don't know. Can anybody see any, any trends here? That's why I put a question mark in the uh, title of the trends. There may, you know, maybe a suggestion of an increase in aluminum here, but certainly uh, probably nothing significant and uh, a lot of variability, which is not at all unusual with soils and soil monitoring. I'll talk a little bit more about that after I show you a little bit more data. Um, sample hydrogen, aluminum is expected to be higher at lower pH in the range Exciting. It's a little bit higher pH, a little more calcium in, in, the, in the soil, and the aluminum is a bit lower. The forehead doesn't have as many B horizons, and it also seems to be a little uh, lower in the aluminum. So calcium. Uh, there's been a lot of concern from the acid rain um, era you know, of the 60s, 70s, 80s of calcium depletion in soils in areas where there's actually not enough calcium to um, support like maple sugar, um, sugar maple growth. And most of these sites, except for Ranch Brook, where there's some calcium in the, in the bedrock, uh, are relatively low in calcium. There's no definite cutoff for what constitutes deficiency of calcium in a soil profile, but these would all be pretty good candidates for, for low calcium. And if you could just pick out one site and forget all the other ones, you could say, well, calcium is coming back. So a lot of people are trying to look at recovery from acid rain and look at calcium in the soil. And there's a lot of variable results found. And here's another example. The, the problem here with Ranch uh, Brook is a lot of variability within the site also. So this is an extremely challenging site. May have difficulty seeing trends in. So a little bit of carbon data. So I just got this data on Wednesday, and I hadn't figured out the error bars for this, but um, again, you can see some ind indications of trends, but uh, nothing startling. Except, well, it's actually startling to see how much the Lye Road site jumped up in carbon. So I have to look more closely at this. These analyses were done by the. Um, Natural Resource Conservation Lab in 
Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, and they're still in progress for most of the results. But carbon in the B horizon, uh, it's no clear trend downward, that's for sure. Um, so one of the one of the concerns with the ongoing climate change and warming temperatures is there may be more um, decomposition of, of soil carbon. So these plots in the future at least will be good candidates for showing that or not. And here's carbon and I've uh, switched to uh, the surface horizon near the uh, OA or the A. So that would be the horizon where organic, organic matter is accumulating. By definition in these soils, uh, if it's greater than 20% carbon, it's an OA. Less than 20% carbon is an, is an A. So three of the sites have OAs. Two of the sites, well, one of them is, is up and down. Again, it's not much of a trend. I do have error bars in, in these. You see these, um, the higher elevation sites, like trail and in the park, and then have the highest accumulation of carbon. So in, in soils, carbon tends to accumulate more under cooler temperatures. Um, decomposition is limited more, more than production. So you can get a lot of carbon accumulating at, at higher, higher elevations. Um, so, this brings me to um, why you shouldn't despair, or why we shouldn't despair looking at these initial results is that um, this is from a, someone in Swiss who they've been doing uh, soil monitoring a little bit longer and the, making the point that you really need to keep sampling on a, um, a period, and they suggest five years is what we've been doing. And instead of looking at the variability, like one year to the next, and doing statistics that way, um, there is so much variability between the years that you really need the long-term trend. So we may be not, if there are changes going on, we probably won't be able to see them for another 15 or 30 or 50 years. So the value of these plots will hopefully keep them going, become more and more evident as time goes over. And this example is just showing that if you do a like, trend after four samplings, which is what we have, this is showing downward trend, but it's not very specific, uh, statistically, but if you keep doing it over a longer and longer time, you, you build up a more robust, robust um, relationship. In fact, in this example, on purpose, going the opposite way from what your initial one. And I don't know if you've looked at a lot of long-term studies of almost anything, you might see, there's a, they often see one trend in the first few years and then a different trend as, as time goes on. So that's my sales pitch for any, any funders in the audience. <laughs> so uh, we redesigned the, the study downward from a 200 to 150 year, but that also means we need more plots. So we're cheating a little bit by dividing plots into four and assuming that it's still random. Uh, which we're going to have to pay a statistician to, to say that for us, I guess. But, um, we can keep doing it for um, 140 more years, beginning, so 135 more years. Just throwing in some mercury data, this doesn't include the last, uh, so this is just through 2012. You can see a good relationship of mercury with elevation, which makes sense because there's more mercury circulating at the higher elevations and there's more rainfall. There's a little bit that doesn't make sense with the light trail. Uh, Jamie Shanley is involved in this mercury work. I'm gonna keep that going. But challenges, variability is a huge challenge. Um, archiving, uh, hopefully the basement of Jeffords will be around for a long time um, and have the samples there. But people keep retiring. I'm going to retire. <laughs> really. I'm getting old. So. Um, it's difficult to get funding for a 150 year experiment. I don't know if anyone has tried. Um, you know, we have had some support through the Forest Service and through the, through the monitoring cooperative, which has been great. And the data is now available online to, if anyone's interested in our first three sets of data. It is available through the FEMC website. It was quite a big effort to get that into uh, archivable format, but it's there, and there's lots of it. Uh, well, there's also tree data and other above board data. Oh, and my time's up, but 
Here's a thanks to everybody who was involved in our last sampling. And also thanks to Tom, who I didn't think would be here today, but he's retired, but he came um, for all his efforts. If you want to know anything about soils in Vermont, Tom's in the room, so he's the guy. Thank you. Do you have time for questions? Absolutely. Questions? Uh, the Swiss data, what do you know about those? Uh, you mentioned them as data that lead you to be optimistic that further sampling. Do they have similar data on their atmospheric deposition and is it similar forest types or? This has been going on for longer, so I think before any, they, the climate change wasn't a concern. Right. So I think a lot of theirs were looking at metals. Um, right. And some of those were atmospheric De deposited lead. I mean, I read his papers, but not for a while, but I, if, if I remember. But I think they're doing everything, but I think they were focusing on, on changes in metals. So you think there's a good chance that we may see the same trend over 50 years? Or well, I think if, if there is change going on, um, well, well, we meant, it's going to take 50 years yeah, to show it. It might take 50 years to show it. That's useful for them. Yeah. At least we started, but 15 years into it. Yeah. Uh, I think you zipped by one of your last slides before you hit mercury and sort of lab variability. So we're talking from lab to lab as we do these analyses. Uh, I didn't have anything about lab variability. We have to check okay, that so out. I, I will ask about lab variability. Yeah. Are you worried about that? Yeah. But um, we did with our first sampling, we ran samples uh, for the exchangeable cations. Actually, in Interestingly enough, the National uh, Natural Resource NRCS lab detection limit for calcium is well above what we can find in our soils. So we couldn't use that to compare. But we ran samples in New Hampshire and we ran them in Vermont and we got really good comparable results. And we've run carbon in Vermont and in the National Lab. We've got really good comparable results and we'll keep doing that. And we have the, one of the reasons to archive the samples is you can go back and run them again and, and either prove or, or question the validity of, of your results or some past results. So. Yes. Jamie. So could you draw any comparison between your study here and um, uh, Greg Lawrence's work where he has showed a recovery based cations? I think, didn't he start earlier? Do his samples go back? Yeah, some of the, his samples go back further where there theoretically could be less calcium than there is in 2002, and most of those, what the problem with those studies is that they're two, usually two snapshots in time, and so I'm not questioning the results of that, but I think it's easier to show weird results in that, so you have to do a lot of those, and I, I think his work was looking at a lot of different studies with two, two sampling points, and a lot of those were showing, I mean there's actually some opposite trends in those, but a lot of them were showing more calcium. Maybe you should have only done two times. So we got a trend. Yeah. Oh, we could just wait another hundred years. Those are the variables. Those are like 80s and 2010 or something like that. Yeah. Some. I mean, there have been some papers where people have gone back after 15 years and found these huge, huge changes in calcium. That's gonna be all the time we have questions. Okay. But Don will be around. Yeah. Yep. More. Thanks.